uh, to the whole team. Um, obviously, of course, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me here uh, today uh, to talk about animal related crimes and how here at the University of Bedfordshire, we integrate that into our teaching. And you might also notice that on my slide, I have the logo of the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences. And um, that's because we actually have a working group, an animal related crimes working group within the Chartered Society, which is in recognition of how important this is as a contemporary topic um, at the moment. Um, it's very much about raising awareness of some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about today, how we can implement changes in education uh, as well as professional uh, practice as well. So obviously want to thank both the University of Bedfordshire where I'm currently um, a senior lecturer in forensic science and also the Chartered Society of Forensic Sciences for supporting this work. Um, I'm not sure about the rest of the audience, but I often get a little bit nervous when I'm asked about innovative teaching. Um, for some that um, uh, conjures ideas of um, very high level uh, science or sophisticated um, software. Um, this actually is very much taking existing knowledge in different spheres and bringing it into the forensic community. Um, so once I go through the introduction of what animal related crimes actually are, um, the innovation almost comes from teaching this way because it's, it's not currently um, widely practiced. Um, Animal related crimes are relevant to a number of teaching areas, predominantly, of course, forensic science, but not just that, uh, criminology, psychology, uh, policing, law. And as I'll talk to you um, shortly, we actually have uh, um, a unit, a module where we deliver this to our biological sciences students. So that's a cohort of students have nothing to do with traditional forensic science. Um, and that's because there's a number of reasons why, why we do that. Um, so if we think about what animal related crimes are, um, I want you to maybe take a moment to think if I wasn't considering, say, wildlife crime, which might spring to mind, uh, or traditional um, animal forensics, which might be looking at um, hair or fur or bones for the inclusion or exclusion of things of interest, we want to consider that, oh, so there's something else then, there's, there's something more here. And um, with, with that, um, this is very much those things, but also we're thinking about uh, domestic animals, for example. We're thinking about how animals can um, be represented in more human sorts of roles. Um, so as I said, this can be pets, it can be working animals, uh, companion animals. And when we do this, we start to really broaden the scope that's available for teaching and training. We know already that the human forensic landscape is very uh, complicated in terms of the types of offences and why people do the things that they do. We then bring in a plethora of other species and things start to get even and more complicated. And if you're also thinking, well, why is this relevant? Um, I would say that one of the best places for me to lead with is that we have changes in legislation where animal related offences are being taken much more seriously, much more early on. So much so we're seeing changes in uh, animal related legislation. And this is happening not just nationally, but also globally. And something that I like to do with my students is to ask them, particularly our international students or students that are very well travelled, might want to look at what's happening in other countries as well as uh, what's happening here. What this, of course, then means as a knock on effect is that there's going to be an increased demand for forensic input. It also opens up possibly even additional careers that perhaps might have not been thought of um, as traditional career paths. I also feel that there's a social uh, responsibility, a societal responsibility here. So I'm going to cover why animal forensics uh, is important, why wildlife crime is forensics, but how this is different from animal related crimes and why um, I believe this is something um, that is worth integrating in, into teaching uh, in more detail. So it probably is not going to come as a great surprise to know that I'm going to offer a bit of a health warning here. 
And I would say um, that whilst I haven't got any overtly graphic images in here, um, the, the sort of things I'm going to be discussing can be quite uncomfortable. And I'd say that was probably one of my biggest learning points. Um, so I went 16 plus years in a forensic practitioner role dealing with predominantly human centric investigations before I became the head of animal forensics. And I just wasn't ready to, to deal with this, this sort of material. And what I found that that also means that our students uh, or the people that we're training might also not be ready. Um, I'm sure many of us um, have had those students that want the most gory, most gruesome case studies. They want to know, um, you know a lot of the, the darker side of it. Uh, um, and actually what we're finding is obviously we have to tread very carefully with this um, because some of the cases, um, animal cases that we, we deal with um, can obviously be uh, quite... Uh, uh, quite violent, quite uh, quite traumatic. There's also um, this whole area that we're discussing is very emotive. Uh, lots of debates here um, about certain things. So whilst I don't have any overly graphic images, there are one or two that might sort of uh, provoke some some thoughts. Uh, we need to be aware that discussions around and uh, particularly animal abuse and within the domestic setting. Uh, can be um, quite distressing and not all of us are, are prepared um, for this. So I'd say that's probably one of my first personal experiences was um, trying to take on board this knowledge in these whole new areas um, and then also cascading that to a new audience that perhaps might not be ready to, to hear these sorts of things. Um, so what is it that I'm doing and what is it that I'm doing that might might be differently? So we could think about what are animal related crimes. Um, so what I've got here is just a document um, that, that I, I produce that I think really encapsulates it, it very well. And this relates to why we have an animal related crime working group and why we called it what it was. So the name was chosen to encapsulate all relevant and wider issues as opposed to a focus on singular, more common topics such as animal forensics or wildlife crime. Now, if most of us are fairly, um, fairly much in acknowledgement and agreement that perpetrators of animal offences may be involved with other incidences, we could consider if we take animal related cases more seriously, could this provide an insight into other activities? I'm also going to talk about, as I sort of mentioned in, in passing, the different roles that animals might play and in different contexts, why this can and cannot be a source of traditional forensic evidence, but also how we can take an animal incident and think human, and we could take a human incident and think animals. Now, just by way of a little bit of background, the concept of uh, this link between animal and human offences is, is not in any way, is not new. It's um, certainly become more embedded in the veterinary profession and in the last sort of 10 plus years or so. The medical community is aware of this for about 30 years so that somebody that perhaps is being um, abusive towards vulnerable uh, persons may also be doing so uh, with animals as well. And we have this, this crossover. Um, what we're trying to do now is spread this throughout policing and forensic um, communities. And the legislation has really been the driver uh, behind that, which I'm going to talk about um, a little bit later. And what we, again, in the working group basically summarised, so if perhaps you're thinking, well, what's this got to do with people that maybe go into forensic science? Well, any personnel visiting properties where any form of interpersonal abuse or violence may have occurred or is suspected should take notice of the presence or indeed the absence of animals, their condition and their environment. Now, many of us with our forensic hats on will be thinking, well, that's not within my remit. I must stay very, uh, very neatly in, inside my area of expertise. So it's acknowledged that this information can be easily overlooked or maybe not considered within within the role. 
But if we look at the investigators of uh, animal offences, such as animal charities, so the RSPC or the Scottish SPCA, they're very aware of human violence within the home when they're investigating incidents relating to animals. So likewise, to really um, sort of connect the dots, human investigators should be likewise informed to avoid missing any warning signs, which may um, result in future crime prevention. And as I said, I'm going to talk about this in a moment in the, in the context of the domestic setting. It's worth saying that this is a huge area. Um, what I've done is pick up some of uh, what I think are the main points that I've experienced, the good and the bad of that, uh, just to share today. Um, I will leave my contact details at the end, um, so please do feel free uh, to contact me if, if you want to know more. Um, but for now, what I'd like us to uh, consider, ask yourself, assuming that many here um, are, are educators, so is wildlife crime taught at your institution? So for the majority of um, forensic and policing personnel, there will be an awareness of, of wildlife crime. And then if you ask yourself, if you put aside wildlife crime, what's left? Are there any other uh, examples where animals feature in your course? And something that might be interesting for you to know is that we once had a forensic biology unit, a huge unit um, and, and very commonly taught within university. We made a point of splitting that into two. We have the human arm and then we have the animal and the environment arm. So this is a demonstrable commitment to the fact that we are showing a clear dedication for teaching within these different areas as well. And again, we try to cascade that information to as, as many people as possible. But again, if you ask yourself, OK, so what's left? What's left beyond um, the biological material, uh, perhaps thinking about DNA with animals or wildlife crime? What do you have left? So and that that can be a question that might take some some time uh, to to answer. So what I'm going to cover of a few points. Um, I've tried to put them in the order that I think most makes sense, um, but I would recommend if there's anything you're interested in, uh, you could uh, embed some of what I'm saying um, or all of it in totality um, for, for, for greater impact, knowing, as I've said, that this can be quite um, challenging. We're recognising that animal-based material in, um, in investigations usually in human centric matters is about excluding uh, any noise, any sampling that um, we might not want to consider. And that is absolutely um, uh, true in some instances, but in other instances, we might need to consider animal and human evidence in totality. And I find it quite interesting in some of the textbooks that, um, that, that I read, in um, forensic textbooks, where they will say, you know, if, if, if in a particular investigation, uh, ignore uh, animal evidence because it's not, it's not relevant. And actually what we want to say is it may or may not be relevant, depending on obviously the context that, that we have. So I think the great place to start is what is the driver behind this work um, that we've been doing. And this is something that's um, known as the links concept. So I would say to you, OK, how do we begin embedding animal related crime? Let's start by thinking links. Now, this does, of course, uh, work in the remit of uh, wildlife crime, but also other types of animals. And as I've said, I'm going to come on to that. Um, the links concept is very much about the, uh, the interrelationships between animal abuse, um, elder abuse, child abuse, um, domestic um, abuse, and how those um, have perhaps been previously considered siloed. And I want to think about them in totality. And um, in the early 1990s, this um, quote essentially was formed, which is when animals are abused, people are at risk. And when people are abused, animals are at risk. So this might not be something that is entirely new. Um, many of us and our students have, or, or our colleagues will be aware 
that we can look back historically at um, some of our uh, more prolific um, offenders that have perhaps practiced or honed their skills on um, animals and then before moving to human um, uh, human offences. And that is true, that, that, that hasn't gone away either. But what we need to be thinking about more in our society, the contemporary at the moment, is that actually animal abuse and human abuse, animal and human offences are occurring concurrently. It's not just this sort of linear uh, progression. Um, I often refer to this as the graduation hypothesis, assuming that somebody has gone from one to the other. But actually, the links concept is recognising that these things can be occurring concurrently. And that is um, something that is well recognised. There's thousands of studies about this psychology, sociology, criminology, law, veterinary work, medical work, as I've mentioned. And what we're seeing now is these once anecdotal observations are being bolstered with facts and figures and case studies. So whilst it's it's not new and we have some awareness of this concept, I want us to be thinking about it, as I've mentioned, in the domestic setting, which, of course, are notoriously um, difficult uh, cases to investigate, partic particularly uh, with um, evidence based and forensic approaches, because in the domestic setting, people will often have legitimate reasons to be in, in contact with others and animals. So maybe a simple way to approach it. So I like to go with a bit of a light touch just to see how um, students are reacting to this. So you could take a case study and think, right, how are people reacting maybe when their pets are threatened or when those act occur. So we have um, taken some of our traditional human case studies and replaced that human with an animal. So for example we have um, some handwriting and ink analysis relating to uh, a ransom note and that ransom note is for a stolen pet. So that's quite a light touch. Now obviously within this context um, we are aware that some animal offences are not investigated by the police. Um, wildlife crime has those priorities that do have um, more of a driver behind them and in some cases uh, forensic uh, support. But a lot of animal welfare cases in particular are going to be undertaken by those animal charities and organisations. So we try to include a mix of animal and human uh, cases and obviously it goes without saying that those animal offences must occur at the hands of a human perpetrator so there will always still be that human element so maybe and I know exactly how I would feel if this happened to me and my pets regardless of what the law might say as my my pet is a uh, property to me they are a member of my family they have names they have birthdays, they get presents, we have a great relationship often with, with our pets. So how might a person feel, the owner feel, if someone stole their pet for whatever reason? And then whilst we apply the forensic techniques involving the evidence or evidence types of choice, we might then start to be thinking, well, what does this say about the perpetrator that's doing these sorts of crimes? And again, this became a learning point for me because of, as a practicing forensic scientist, we're not meant to be concerned with why someone does it, what's their motivation and what else might they be up to. But in the learning space, we can ask those questions. So what else might that perpetrator be doing or potentially planning? And that gives you the scope then to introduce more complex cases, and perhaps an increase in um, severity, and then deeper consideration of the interactions between um, animals and, uh, and, and human offences. So one of the things that I like is then to start thinking about
animals in their own weaknesses. So if we think involved in sex, there's something that is happening. They might be a victim in their own right because something is happening to them. Um, certain animals will engage um, you know, in a protective, violent way to somebody that is uh, harming or shouting or physically being aggressive to, uh, to their owner in a protector. We also um, have cases where um, rather aggressive looking and trained dogs or even sort of, you know, hair, uh, sort of scary looking venomous reptiles uh, and other animals are used to actually protect things that people don't want finding. This could include um, weapons, drugs, money, illicit material, etc., where perhaps um, most of your traditional examiners of a scene or in a home are probably not going to want to go anywhere near uh, uh, that. But it is actually acknowledged that animals can be used in various ways. Um, they can be considered as legal weapons. So you can't walk down the street with a, or you're not meant to walk down the street, of course, with a, a knife or a gun, but you could have an animal that has been uh, trained. And by training, of course, this isn't nice, um, shake my hand, get a treat. These are animals that have been trained to be uh, aggressive that can be used to take down animals or indeed humans. And there's a number of um, cases, um, including some of the first utilization of um, uh, animal DNA in a case that where the dog was considered a legal weapon and the dog was used by a gang to take down um, um, a, a young boy um, and then further acts of violence were perpetrated. So we can almost see there's illegal, uh, legal weapons, if you like. So if we consider these different roles, and then we have this requirement to maybe think human, so what would we do if the situation that we're seeing that involves animals involves humans? Does this change your approach in any way? Does it change the potential animal evidence that, that's available? So I would say, you know, revisit any current case scenarios that you use in teaching or assessments and ask yourself, is there scope to include animals? And then maybe not just from um, the evidential point of view, so our fluffy felines and our dribbly dogs are excellent sources of biological material, but also what roles might these animals play? And then how do we, as pet owners or, or those who are keeping and caring for animals feel if that animal is then targeted and, and threatened. And that's what we're going to come on to with, uh, with this links concept in, 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 a, in a bit more detail. So I think it's really fascinating to consider the, the different roles. Um, as far as the animal as a victim goes, um, We'll all be aware that there are veterinary professionals out there to fix and treat um, the animals, those that obviously make it to the vets. There's a number, of course, that, uh, that don't. Um, and it's interesting to note that even though there is legislation that sits squarely on veterinary shoulders in this country, um, that forensic procedures and practices aren't routinely taught within the veterinary uh, community. Um, and that's some training that uh, that we've been in involved with here. So it's not just their issue. Um, and then there starts to now be as veterinary students are becoming more aware of um, animal uh, abuse and the requirement for forensic techniques to be to be applied. So again, we're starting to see this the see this demand. Um, of forensic methods, but just utilise in a, in a different setting. So as I say, maybe revisit your traditional scenarios and is there a scope to maybe uh, change in there and include animals? And we also, of course, know about the absence of evidence being incredibly important. So in a violent household, um, the absence of animals uh, that were previously there can be quite significant. And I was having a conversation um, with other colleagues and they said, well, you know, nobody generally except the people that are involved are going to notice when an animal goes missing. You know, there's no phone records or bank records, etc. Et et um, so 
it might be that nobody notices. And that's really the point here, because a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about exist because perpetrators think they can get away with it. And the point is that they can, that they have been able to. Um, and that's why we need to maybe another reason for, for, for changing our thinking. So if you then maybe find that you're getting a good response to this, um, you might want to consider moving from that light touch uh, to more complicated or, or more severe cases. Um, so one that I utilise uh, would be the attempted killing of a pet. So I'm going to show a photograph here and it's actually I'm going to say the word just an X-ray, um, but it's an X-ray that is uh, quite significant here. So this is the case of Scamp the Terrier and you can see that a, uh, a nail has been hammered through the skull of Scamp. And Scamp was then um, buried alive and it was actually passers-by that heard a whimpering under the ground. Uh, and they recovered Scamp and, and took him to um, took him to the vets. Um, unfortunately, he had to be euthanized um, because of his his injuries. Um, but if we just move away just momentarily from how awful this is the case, think of the the, the evidential possibilities that is, um, that happen with with this. Um, so it's not in its um, you know, the, the, not showing the animal itself, but here, that that picture in in itself is 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 really quite um, challenging to 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 consider. Um, so from from there, again, what does this say about the person that's done it and why they have? done it um, how would the owner feel about this what else might the perpetrator be doing or planning so if we think of this for example in the concept now of uh, badger baiting or illegal dog fights again this training of animals um, to to uh, to be aggressive or to be very hungry they can be starved for a fight they can be given all kinds of uh, illicit substances to make them behave in, in a certain way this is not nice training of, of animals but within these other cases um, you've then got as I've said um, illegal gambling illegal sharing of material drugs money um, especially with um, illegal dog fights, these are huge, serious organised crimes. You know, this isn't just a, a couple of folks taking their dogs down to a car park at night and letting them have a go at each other. These are significant weapons and drug holes that are recovered at, uh, at, at these events. So we can really then start to think about how criminal behaviour may be perpetrated against animals, against humans and other criminal acts. Um, so whilst I appreciate that is a, a, a very thought provoking image, um, I thought I might just swiftly move on to how I integrate this from an assessment point of view. So I start with a light touch, introducing animal related crimes, get a sort of feel for how the students are responding to the material. Um, I always in my teaching um, give students the opportunity to raise anonymously or with confidence, uh, with confidentiality, any issues that they already might be sensitive uh, about and give them warning that this this material is is coming. So start with a light touch. Um, move to some other aspects um, and one of them would be okay how do I now introduce this into an assessment so we have a unit called animals and plants in crime so that's one half of our traditional forensic biology program and I teach this to forensic science students criminology students and biological science students so we have a range of different students of different scientific uh, knowledge and different forensic knowledge. So other than the challenge that's associated, of course, with differentiating for, for, for different students, I wanted to incorporate a type of assessment that was quite different from anything else that they had. So um, I developed something that I call an, an interactive lab based exam. Now, obviously, this approach will work for um, 
other areas, not just for animal uh, or, or environmental issues, but this is where I specifically utilize it. So this is an invigilated exam and the students are of, often respond very well to this. I feel that they don't, I'm not saying that it doesn't come with the stress and anxiety of an assessment, but um, they often feel more uh, more comfortable in this environment it's labs that they know um, and they're presented with material so this includes it might be something under the microscope it might be a bone or a specimen so we've got that sort of interactive kinesthetic issue for some of those students that like to feel that the assessment isn't really assessment they might be given uh, specimens or samples and I ask them questions about the thing that they are seeing usually a couple of really short quick answer ones and then a slightly longer written piece about something associated with that um, we've had really great feedback from the students and external examiners uh, uh, with, with this approach and I'd be really interested to hear from those of you that are doing uh, something similar um, with this too. Um, what I particularly like about it is um, this avoids some of the major issues we're having at the moment with AI, with plagiarism, with copying and collusion. So these are handwritten notes in, in the lab. So they hand that script in. So um, we, we found that to be a, um, an effective way uh, to bypass some of the problems that, uh, uh, that, that we're seeing with more traditional assessment types. So what I also then like to do is um, get students to help me with my workload and as far as assignments go or homework asking students to think about or tell me programs that they've watched where there's an interaction between animals and humans um, as I said isn't isn't bad as far as homework goes and um, with the best will in the world I can't watch all of these uh, these programs and um, I don't always um, have the time to be up, up, up to date with things like that um, so what I like to do here is get students to engage by using popular media. It can be um, fact or fiction to demonstrate that link and to engage students. And it helps me keep my material uh, fresh as well. What I would say here about um, cases, uh, either for yourselves or for the students, um, is to be very, very mindful of social media. My preference is to use uh, programs or um, reasonably authoritative news sources. Uh, the internet is full of all kinds of things, as you know, uh, and it, it doesn't take long to, to find something particularly uh, un unpleasant. Um, and another side note for some of you might be interested in, particularly if you're teaching criminology or psychology or even just to have a debate or a discussion in the classroom, is how the rise in social media is fueling animal abuse. Because now we have a, a platform for people wanting to get likes and outrage and sharing that that material. We've got a number of examples um where, where where that's the case so we have to be quite careful um with that um so i try to get students even though i know without a doubt they're going to be seeing things before they hit the news uh, outlets on their various social media uh, apps and, and whatnot i just be just being mindful that unfortunately they obviously we know the internet is not infallible and people are uploading and sharing um, some 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 quite um, graphic material. What I like to do then here is get students to do this, as I say, not bad homework uh, and then give them the opportunity to experience flipped learning. Um, so it gives me a chance to sit back and relax, update my material and get the students to talk about the programmes that they've seen. Um, and I'm sure many of us teaching forensic science um, will will sit with sort of gnashed teeth watching um, whether the representation of forensic methodologies and approaches is in fact true. Um, and again, that, that that's another aspect. Um, so this is a good way to sometimes I like to watch documentaries and tell myself I'm doing work. Um, but again, with students, it's a, it's a great way for them to maybe start to be aware of that link in a way that they weren't 
uh, before, but we know that um, that um, the um, any form of abuse towards animal within uh, television or, or the media becomes um, a, a startling point for the audience. So where does that come from? Why? Why is that happening? And, and, and what can we do about that? Um, it might be that your preference is to try to integrate it, maybe with a, um, either some data to know that, for example, the Ministry of Justice have been uh, collecting data about offenders who previously had cautions or convictions for animal abuse or animal cruelty before going on to human offences. So that in itself becomes something you can discuss. Or maybe you are teaching um, data handling and statistics and the presentation of data. Um, so we've got the, the thoughts that organisations, high level organisations are collating this information and why. Maybe students or yourselves might be more convinced by statistics. So the shows are great, you know, the anecdotal um, uh, cases that we're seeing are great, but where are we now seeing this in, in a way that moves from the anecdotal in, into the factual? Um, and then this is just a snapshot of some of that, that data, uh, and it includes within the violence against the person and sexual offences, some very high level um, uh, offences such as uh, murder, paedophilia, child cruelty, uh, neglect and elder abuse as well. Uh, and then there's lots of things that we can also say with those uh, drugs offences and um, what patterns are, are we seeing here. And the reason why I do this and I often sort of present evidence for the links in all these various facets because it's conventional wisdom that animal abuse precedes human violence or human uh, based offences. But the fact the two are uh, co-occurring and interwoven. And that's the real point. And I think um, this is why we're seeing um, animal related crimes being taken more seriously, because, of course, there's that, that crime preventative element. We're not, of course, saying that everyone that um, perhaps uh, hurts an animal is going to go on um, to particularly violent offences. There's always a reason behind why people have done, done certain things, but we know that, we that there has been this progression and we know that often abusers will target a number of vulnerable entities, whether that's the young, the old, their intimate partners, um, and of course, uh, animals within there. So I think about this when I go back to this links concept of what does this mean in the domestic setting? Well, this is quite simply, um, and, I, and I say simple because I hadn't thought about this um, until, as I say, I was, was involved in animal uh, related crimes and working with the veterinary community um, and animal charities and agencies, that this is um, exploiting animals in the domestic setting to control and coerce others. And we also see this in, in family law as well, the things that are happening again, sort of siloed uh, to, to our world, but we're seeing the same themes here. So this is where we're seeing threats to animals and the actuality of those threats being being carried out. Um, if you leave me, I will kill, kill the cat or the rabbit. We've had cases where animals have specifically been bought and we create as humans a very quick bond with animals just to have that bond severed by the controlling perpetrator taking them away or doing something quite um, awful to them and often in front of um, the person or persons that they're trying to to control and this leads into adverse childhood experiences for any of you that are teaching those elements um, witnessing any form of um, violence or abuse in the household um, can lead on to various uh, types of, of behavior um, and what we're thinking in this instance is how is perhaps understanding what's happening to animals giving us an insight into what's known as hidden crimes, crimes that are notoriously difficult uh, to, to be evidence-based, 
um, to have wit wit witnesses that are willing to talk about what's happened. So we're actually seeing now the recognition of uh, coercive and controlling behaviour in the legislation and also the roles that animals feature. And I think that is really telling. Um, I'm just going to show some data here in relation to statistics for domestic uh, abuse. And as I've said, um, this in itself can be a challenging concept to, uh, to discuss. It might be that you don't necessarily do this with your students, but you might want to understand the landscape in, in, in more detail. And there's lots of research out there and lots of data. Um, now, interestingly, some of the data that I've got here is just what's happening between 16 and 59 year olds. So, you know, that gives us a huge pool of persons that are not being uh, counted at here. But um, the things that I found particularly striking was um, how much of this concurrent behaviour we, we see. So animal abuse being 11 times more likely in a violent household. Animal abusers are five times more likely to commit further crimes. And children are 60 times more likely to be abused in the household if you're seeing partner and, and pet abuse. And that then goes into you know, 30 years ago, teaching the medical community to recognise that people will harm children, including the parents, and the diagnostic features to recognise non-accidental or deliberate injury in children is exactly the same as the vets use. It's the same model with the exception, of course, the, uh, available, uh, the availability of verbal communication. We can then think about, um, as I said, these pets as victims in, in their own right. Over 50% of our households have pets that we consider part of, of the family. Um, if 60 to 80% of domestic abuse cases include harm or threats to pets, and there has been more recently some work done in refuge centres um, where victims or actually what the preferred term are survivors of uh, domestic uh, incidences have um, discussed um, what's happened with, with, within their home um, so much so um, that you might be aware that there are pet fostering um, in, incredible charities where you know people won't leave their home because their animal they can't come with them to a, a traditional refuge so there's actually now um, and has been for some while and there's great coverage over the UK of, of pet fostering because people won't leave their animals at home they won't leave them um, a because it's a source of uh, comfort and companionship for them but also if somebody threatens your animal and if you leave me I will do this then it's no surprise um, of, of how many people stay. So this allows us an insight into hidden crimes. Um, it's the reason why it's taught to uh, the vet veterinary students of the future to recognise um, that perhaps some of the injuries that they're seeing may have been uh, inflicted potentially by the owner and uh, may not be truthful about how those injuries have come across that as um, policing or forensic personnel would go into a human uh, dwelling and if you're looking for signs of controlling or coercive behavior by looking to the animals this can sometimes give a greater insight than just looking into the human side of it um, themselves. Um, so I think I uh, read a paper re recently um, and they were citing yeah, about 70, 75, 76 percent of animal abusers also abuse a, a family member. Um, so again, it's it's that you know, who who's doing what and what else might they be doing? So I mentioned um, that these statistics, this link concept, is being taken very seriously. So much so that we are seeing that change through legislation. Um, Particularly in this country, what was really interesting, I found um, that the day the, the Forensic Regulator Act received uh, royal assent was the same day that the Animal Welfare Sentencing Act received royal assent. And what this meant was that within some sections, some offences under the Animal Welfare Act 2006 here in England and Wales, 
move those offences from summary only to triable either way. So with that shift potentially into Crown Court to a jury, jury of, from a nation of animal lovers, as we're often referred to, that moving to Crown Court, that there's a potential increase in the penalties received and a shift from um, six months imprisonment um, to five years. So the, um, the knock-on effect of that is those that are um, investigating and prosecuting offences will need to have uh, more robust investigations and there may be a requirement for forensic working. Likewise, on the defence side, um, there's a, a, a very uh, interesting number and type of cases that were actually coming through the defence side because the defendants um, essentially have, have a, a lot more to uh, to lose here and the hope is that the legislation in this context would act as a deterrent. Six months in prison that you might not get in a magistrate's court that nobody knows about what you've been doing um, versus more severe cases being heard in a Crown Court, more public awareness um, and a great, a great uh, um, issue here. So what we also want to look at is what's happening in um, perhaps our allied uh, with our neighbours. So in Scotland, the Domestic uh, Abuse Act was updated uh, recently um, to actually say that acts of pet abuse are illegal. So recognising that pet, its own right. And they also recognise that threatening someone's pet is a form of abuse. And this leads into how... Uh, more seriously, we're taking controlling and coercive uh, stalking and harassment uh, behaviour. So that's a, you know, that is a, a just an incredible piece of legislation. Um, globally, a lot of similarities here. Um, I think um, uh, I think it's maybe a couple of years ago now that it was first. Um, um, the first federal legislation for uh, animal cruelty in, in, in America here um, to, to, for us to consider here. Um, and as again, you can bring in um, what's happening in other countries and uh, comparing those and also accepting that within different countries, there's different cultures. Um, so how are animals treated differently in different countries? Um, but what I really want us to think about is that um, however you might feel about what animal related crimes really are, uh, what the link concept is, that the change in legislation means that we are seeing a change in investigative approaches. This means we have to update our educational approaches and our trainings. We teach the new new ultimately. Um, and this now sees a requirement for greater forensic input into these cases and that actually you might have human and animal cases um, in, interlinked. Um, so there's a lot of momentum um, uh, behind this. So why should we be teaching this? Who should we be teaching this to and how do we do it? And the landscape, as I've said, is absolutely huge. You know, I've had to just pick what I thought uh, were maybe the quick wins. So how you can start doing this. Uh, and then there's so much scope for research here, collaborative working with vets, with agencies, obviously policing um, animal investigation charities, those of you on sort of criminology and psychology programmes as well. So just to round off here then would be the key messages that I tend to share with my students, that animal related crimes generally don't occur in isolation. Yes, of course, like all offences, there has to be a first time. Um, but what we see within the animal world is that this abuse can repeat and escalate. And when animals are abused, people are at risk and vice versa. So whichever side of the investigation you're on, um, sort of widen your, your scope there. And obviously all, all animal offences occur at the hands of a human perpetrator. We have this recognition of the links that uh, the, uh, the interrelationships between animal and uh, human offences is being recognised more widely in practice, in research, and most importantly, in legislation. And we're seeing that globally bringing about those increased penalties and sentences. 
and relevance to us as a community, regardless of um, perhaps the role that, that you're in, we're seeing a change in the way that these cases are investigating. And I suppose quite simply is follow a more human approach. What would you do if the things that you were seeing were happening to humans? Likewise, with vets, we often teach them, well, if that if that was a, a, instead of a animal, it's a human. Maybe you go instead of a human, it's now an animal. Um, so there's really quite a lot of scope for how you might want to, to, to deliver this material. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'd like to thank you uh, for, for your attention here. Um, please feel free to email me um, or come find me on LinkedIn or X or Twitter. Um, and as I've said, um, a huge thank you to uh, the remote CSI team and of course yourselves um, for sharing um, your time with me today. Thank you very much.